Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. As always, I hope you had a great week. And you can always find Let's Talk Micro on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, TuneIn Radio, Good Pods, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find Let's Talk Micro. As far as social media, I am on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube as Let's Talk Micro, on LinkedIn as Luis Plaza, and on X as Let's Talk Micro 1. I also have an email address, which is Let's Talk Micro at Outlook.com. So please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast, download episodes, leave a review if the app allows you to do so. And if you have any feedback, any suggestions, you can definitely submit those via social media or email them. As always, thank you for the support. And if you haven't listened to the previous episode, please go ahead and do so. It was part two of Dr. Joel Mortensen's story about when he went over to Guinea in Africa to help train your laboratory personnel at a hospital there, at a pediatric hospital, and he shares his experiences. So that episode, it was a great talk and it was divided into two parts. And then um, last week, part two came out. So please, if you haven't checked it out, go ahead and do so. It was such a great episode. Definitely a lot of challenges he encountered, you know, with supplies, with training, with the facilities. So I guarantee that you're going to like it. So please go ahead and check it out. So as I'm recording this, you know, I just got back from my D week at Boston. It was such a great experience. And if maybe you were listening on YouTube, I did I did a live episode over there, which is what this episode is. And in that episode, you know, it just started with a quick interview with Dr. Uh, Tim Gauthier. He's a pharmacist from Florida and he has a blog, you know, where he talks about antibiotics and he even has a book. And then after that, I move on to talk about my experiences at ID Week. You know, I compare it with ASM and I talked about the my favorite posters and talks. So once again, you know, I had such a great time. I learned a lot. I met some great people. So I hope you enjoyed this live episode. So let's go ahead and listen to it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a live episode of Let's Talk Micro, live from ID Week, as I as promised. And just like I did at ASM Micro in June, you know, I just sit down, talk a little bit about my posters, my experiences, and I will get to that. Uh, but I have a guest that's going to be in for a few minutes, and then it was moving on to other things. So I'm just going to um, open the floor. So his name is. Uh, uh, Dr. Tim Gauthier, and he's a pharmacist and uh, from Florida, just like me. And uh, so I'm just going to be asking a couple of questions, and 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 then after that we'll move on to the posters and the sessions that I like the most. So, Dr. Gauthier, welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hi, I'm happy to be here, and I I see your podcast every time I log into my Amazon Music app, and I always smile, and um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, and, and, I, and I saw that and it's, it is always great when I, I see someone that is listening. You never know. You know, I sit here and I talk to myself and, you know, if no one listens, I will still do it. I, I love it so much, the whole process. Um, so I know we're a little short on time, so I'm just going to move on right away. Um, you have attended ID Week before, right? Yes, yes, of course. Yes. And so far, so what's, what has been your experience with this one? I think that. ID Week is a wonderful conference to come through for a number of reasons. And this, this time around, um, I've been really involved with some of the presentations and I have had two posters. And I think that is a really rewarding experience to like share my perspectives and share my knowledge, but then also to sit next to and see some of the other people that are doing like things and get inspired by them. That is one of the best things I've taken away from this. And also to in addition, make some connections that I didn't have before and meet some people, put faces to names, especially from, you know, Twitter and social media where you, you feel like, you know, people, but you don't know them. And then you get to meet them in real life, IRL. And so that's been really enjoyable. But honestly, there's so many enjoyable elements to ID week from a trainee to a, a, practi a practicing clinician that uh, it's a really a valuable conference, in my opinion. OK, yeah. And, and I agree with that. It's, it's definitely a strange uh, feeling and then. And... You know, the first year of my podcast, I, it was everything was through Zoom, no meetings. And then I started showing up to them. And sometimes, you know, people see, well, I just saw you through a little screen. And is that you? And so it's always great uh, meeting the guests and meeting uh, people. And 
and my experience has been very positive as well. Uh, I learned a lot, and to the audience, just hang in there. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but also, you know, I talk in this podcast about people that take their time and, you know, use their time, their education, their training to make things better, to teach others, to help out, and, uh, you know, not to put you on the spot, but you're here, Dr. Um, you do just that, right? You have a blog, and if you want to talk about it, uh, so the audience can check it out. Yeah, sure. Um, so I do a lot of different things and on social media and try to promote safe uh, antibiotic use and awareness of, of the nuances of antimicrobial pharmacotherapy through, you know, combining memes or GIFs or emojis and, and fun and try to take, make it entertaining, but also educational and clinically relevant. So those are some, some things I try to put together. And I have my blog, which is idstewardship.com. And there's a lot of different elements there. I have a, a stuff free study guide. I have uh, various blog posts about antimicrobial stewardship in different countries or things like renal dose adjustments, IVDPO. So, you know, fundamental stewardship to more like interesting pieces because that's what I'm interested in. I even have one about if you want to name your cat or dog after an antibiotic, some ideas for you. No. <laughs> Pip and Tezo, maybe if you have two cats. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of resources there. We do an ASP chat, uh, which is a Twitter chat, now an X chat. Uh, usually once a month this year, it's been a little bit slower. So we try to engage on that platform and share ideas. And that's a really cool way to get new readings that I haven't identified before, get inspired to think of how can I be more effective at work and how can I use different strategies that are out there and share my knowledge with like-minded individuals. Um, and, you know, I just try to stay engaged with things that I love and that's what keeps it going. You know, I really enjoy working with antibiotics. I think the peers that you see at ID Week and that I get to work with on my blog, you know, there's wonderful people and I feel like I'm blessed to be able to work with them on the things that we work together on. That is great. And I, and I completely understand. And, and, you know, I, I started doing this and it's a little bit of a smaller scale, but, you know, stepping out of the lab and, sharing the things that I have learned on the bench and helping people and just bringing all the resources, definitely a lot of information. And when you're a tech, just sitting on that bench and you're accepting that susceptibility profile, it's, it's a lot. Um, so definitely to the audience, take the time to check the, the blog and, uh, and Dr. Gauthier, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to, for being on the live episode of Let's Talk Micro. <laughs> it's my pleasure. I'm a, I'm a fan and I love to, to watch you guys grow and I look forward to seeing what comes in the future. All right. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone, to the audience. Um, so I am trying this on YouTube live. We had some technical difficulties earlier, so I apologize for that. Um, so bear with me. You know, the pace is not going to be the same. Um, if you hear the noises, you know, please bear with me. But I thought it would be cool to experiment with it. So this is Louis Plaza from Let's Talk Micro. This is a live episode. I just had a guess uh, that he was here for a few minutes, and that will be on the, on the edited version of this episode. Definitely. As I said before, uh, you know, I did ASM in June and it was a great experience. I learned so much. I connected with people. I connected with guests and it was, it was such a positive experience. And I decided to attend ID Week, which is, you know, it's the event from the, from the Infectious Diseases Society of America. And I will talk more about that. But it's just, there are some good micro lectures that I overall and some great posters and, and I got to connect with guests again and it's coming to an end, but I will definitely recommend that if you get the chance to attend it, uh, please go ahead and do so. It's just, it's, um, it's definitely a very positive experience. So I thought, you know, I thought I will start by saying, you know, well, what is ID week? And this is from their, from their website. So ID week is the joint annual meeting of the infectious disease society of America. The Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, the HIV Medicine Association, the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, and the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists, or SD, SIDP. So this is from their website. So it's a, it's a, it's a joint effort. And so we, here we get people from all, from all walks. So we have, you know, we have physicians, we have healthcare professionals, we have pharmacists, which is always, you know, it's really good when you when you get to connect with people from from other areas, right? You step step away from the lab a little bit and and, and learn what happens beyond those results that you do. We go right. We go to the lab. We put our results in. You know, we result that susceptibility. We accept that ID, and then what happens, right? Well, we know that there's a huge impact about what we do, and 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 we affect the treatment of the patient based on what we put out there. But hearing all the, you know, the pharmacists talk about 
you know, dosages and medications and, and seeing the doctors talk about organisms and treatment. So it's really great to see the whole picture and just, and I always talk about this a lot, but it, it's, it's such an eye-opening experience. Sometimes, you know, we're so busy in the lab that we don't, we do our job, we go home and, and right, we're all busy, we have families. So it's a complicated issue, but there's so much more. It's such a huge world and, and you know, this is all connected. So it's just, I always, uh, if you get, if you have the time and you have the, I guess, the funds, definitely check out one of these conferences, you know, whether it's ASM Micro or ID Week. It's, uh, I definitely recommend it. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and use this time to talk about my experiences and what I have liked. So let's go ahead and start. So first of all, it's, it's, it's similar to ASM Microbe in the sense that there are both huge events. Microbiology, you know, ASM Microbe, it's more towards the microbiologist. And this one is, you know, more healthcare professionals, physicians, pharmacists, but they are very large events. Um, however, this one, ID Week, is larger. And from what I have heard, you know, the assistance this year is higher than any year before. And I'm not going to give you numbers right now because I haven't confirmed anything. Uh, but I have heard from multiple people saying that it's, it's, it has been a very successful event. So that's one of the similarities. You know, they both have sessions. They have posters. People present, you know, their abstracts. They do oral abstracts where... Right, they talk about them. They do rapid fire presentations, just like ASM Micro. But as far as the people, you know, you get more attendance here. It's larger, but you get that atmosphere of a huge event that we're right. This there's this energy. There's so much to do, and so a lot of energy. But like I said, you know, some some great posters, some great presentations, and and I keep saying it, but definitely a great experience overall. So those are the similarities with ASM microbe. I mean, they're within the infectious disease, you know, the, the, the target demographic for ID, ID Week is a little bit different, but pretty similar format. So you stay busy, you have to stay organized, you have to pick and choose what you want because you're going to consume a lot of time as you are trying to get to, what, you know, attend some lectures, and, but you cannot attend them all. So it's going to be very difficult. Um, so, but overall, you just pick the ones that you like the most. And then if you like me, you know, I, I do this podcast and I like to connect with people and, and try to meet more listeners and uh, meet potential guests. So I do spend a lot of time on the posters and that's very time consuming. So your days will go by fast and there are long days. I mean, if you attend everything, you can be in from 8 p.m. a.m. Sorry, all the way to 5 p.m. So those are busy days. So at the end, you're tired. But if you're into this, it's definitely very rewarding and very worth it. So now that I have said that and I have compared ASM to ID Week, let me go ahead and start uh, with the talks that I attended that I like. And if you're registered for ID Week and you're listening to this and you can access the recordings later, uh, please go ahead and do so and, and check them out. These are the ones that I definitely like the most. So let me start with the talks that I have that um, the first one was MPOX, a case study of syndemic, syndemic response by Dr. Dimitri Daslakis, who served as the deputy coordinator of the White House National MPOX response. And he currently is serving as the acting director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the CDC. And he talked about you know, he get, did a great presentation on MPOX and about how it affected. Uh, he talked about the demographics and, and, you know, people with access to healthcare. And he talked about, you know, the disparity sometimes, you know, between the race and, and a lot of good information regarding MPOX. So definitely, uh, if the recording is available and I cannot, I am not sure if it is, please go ahead and check it out. And then the second one was the system-wide implementation of a new urine culture to optimize diagnostic stewardship by Lisa Parlich. And she's an infection preventionist and a former M and an MLS as well from Northwestern Medicine, Illinois. I actually I had the chance to talk to her 
um, after the presentation and, and she did a great, it was great. Those of you that work in micro and you work with your cultures, you know that you have this order, that the order of the year analysis and, and it reflexes to a culture if it's positive. Uh, so she basically that algorithm was meant to change that order. Um, so the end result is that the providers have to answer some questions before ordering the urine culture, and it's not ordered as a standalone. I mean, the urine analysis, yes, but not the culture, and that just reduces the the number of cultures that are done. And and those of you that work in micro, and you know, the culture is ordered, something is grow, something grows, and you report it, then the patient gets potentially treated, which I'm going to be talking more about that uh, later today. So, and then you, you're increasing the potential of antimicrobial resistance, right? Patient gets prescribed antibi antibiotics. Maybe it was not necessary for them to get it. And I'm not, I'm just staying, you know, on the edge of this, you know, I'm not a physician. I don't, I don't have that training and I don't know that part of the, of the picture. So I'm just speaking from what I see from my side. So everything that you report, right? We get this request, you know, please susceptibility on this organism. And then we go ahead and do them. And then maybe we have a request for more. So we can potentially increase the, the, the probabilities of contributing to AMR. So with this, with this uh, order change, you know, this, this system-wide implementation, it's... It, make, it's, it reduces the number of cultures that get ordered. And I think that this was a great topic, one that really resonated with what I do. So it was great talking to her. And then the next one was, and just to make sure from, from before, now that I start talking that system-wide implementation of hearing cultures and going down the list, these are oral abstracts. But they were very interesting. So the third one was the efficacy of sulbactam durlobactam compared to colistine against Acinetobacter bomani calcoceticus complex, monomicrobial and polymicrobial infections in a phase three trial. And this was done by Sarah McLeod, who is a senior director at Innoviva Specialty Therapeutics. So definitely very interesting uh, hearing about that. I don't know if you're too familiar with Sulbactam Durlobactam, but it was, just, it was you know, FDA approved uh, and it's just for you know, for the treatment of, uh, of Vaccinobacter bomani. So it, look, it's looking, you know, it looks like the results are very good with the drug and, and isolates show a great deal of susceptibility towards them. So here in that comparison, you know, between that and colistine, you know, colistine was a drug that is an older drug that was brought back at some point because, you know, there were not that many choices. Um, but it's not good for the patients. Like it tends to be a little nephrotoxic. So that was a great talk. And then the next one was, how do I determine the likely antibiotic resistant mechanism based on the antibiotic susceptibility profile and why should I care? And this was by Dr. Michael Satlin from Well Cornell Medicine. This was a very interesting oral abstract, you know, thinking about your, your, your mechanisms and your profile and you start thinking, right, things about like ESBL and MC and, and the importance of these mechanisms and how they correlate to the susceptibilities. It was definitely a very interesting topic. And then the next one was a multi-center observational study to compare the effectiveness of ceftacidine avivactam, which we, we, know, we know as avicas, versus ceftolozane tasobactam, which is cerbaxa for multi-drug resistant pseudomonas originals infections in the United States. And this was done by Dr. Ryan Shields, which is a pharmacist and associate professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. So those talks, you know, they were definitely great. You know, there was another one about the activity of stenotrophomonas and uh, of stenotrophomonas and, and ceftazidine which was, this one was, ceftacidine retains in vivo efficacy against strains of Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, for which traditional testing predicts resistance. And this is by Dr. Matthew Phillips. And this is also very interesting. I don't know if you, um, yeah, they were talking about, they did some testing with ceftacidine and maybe the, the susceptibility varied depending. They used like a couple of different methods. So if you, 
register once again and you want to check it out, please go ahead and do so. So after those abstracts, those oral abstracts, I actually got to do something that I enjoy a lot, you know, which is, uh, which is uh, listen to a recording of a podcast. And as you know, those of you that are into microbiology podcasts and you know, infectious diseases and things, you know, you know, Microbe TV, you know, with Vincent Racanello, and there's a there's a network of podcasts. Um, you know, you have this week in microbiology, this week in parasitism. Uh, there's there's quite a, a few of them, and one of them it's called the Infectious Disease Podcast with Dr. Daniel Griffin and Dr. Sarah Dong. Sarah Dong, as you know, she is the host uh, and creator of the Febrile Podcast, a very successful podcast. You know, I had the the opportunity to do an episode with her, uh, which is the journey of a blood culture. So definitely check it out if you haven't already. Go to the the infectious the, the febrile pod, the febrile podcast, which is in all podcast platforms, and look up for that episode, the journey of a blood culture, and I talk what happens to the blood cultures when they get to the lab. So it's always nice, as I say, to connect those things. Right, you get it in the lab, you grow it, you do the testing, you report it, and then what happens after that? What does the physician do with that information? How is the pharmacy involved? So it was, it was a great episode, and it was fun doing that episode with Sarah. Uh, I hope that at one point in time we get to do something again. You know, I, I love collaborations and supporting fellow uh, microbiology infectious disease uh, podcasts. You know, there's not that many of us out there, uh, but we are, I think, and, you know, we're doing a, a good job of staying motivated and, and sharing our information and making sure that, you know, we help out, right? So. Uh, making things better by explaining this information that, as you know, it can be very complicated. So then I got to, I got to watch that episode being recorded. I got to meet Dr. Daniel Griffin, you know, very nice. I got to meet Dr. Vincent Racanello, very nice as well. Um, you know, it's kind of like one of those Hollywood feelings where you, where you get, you know, you see this popular podcast and then you know you meet the people behind it so it's 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 great it's a great feeling you know if you're into this uh meeting some of those podcasters so unfortunately uh dr dong was not there Um, she had a conflict so i was you know hoping to meet her while i was here but you know it's, it's a very crowded place a lot of stuff going on so sometimes it's hard to get to see people so maybe next time i'll 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 get to meet her. But it was as nice. And then I got to tell them about my podcast, which this is something that you, the audience, you know, I continue to, to, I I want to ask you if you, if you listen to Let's Talk Micro and and you like it, please, you know, tell your coworkers. If you're a teacher, tell your students, share the information. You know, sometimes, you know, there's still a little bit of unawareness about Let's Talk Micro and I'm trying to correct that. Uh, so definitely share information, let people know, hey, there's this podcast called Let's Talk Micro. And that way people can you know, access it, download episodes and get that content and then in turn recommend it to others. So, so I got to tell them about my podcast and that was really cool. So now they know maybe one day we can do some, some sort of collaboration. I don't know, but it was, it was a great experience. And as you know, when I was in Microbe and June, I got to watch an episode of, of, uh, of Editors in Conversation from the ASM. That was a cool experience, you know, which actually, you know, that episode was with uh, Dr. Benjamin Pinsky and Dr. Ryan Relich, which they ended up being guests on the podcast. I mean, Dr. Pinsky did the episode about viruses and Dr. Relich did that one with him. And then he did the one with Francis Sella, which if you haven't checked them out, please go ahead and do so. Those are the episodes of Talking Francis Sella with Dr. Uh, Kenneth Gavina and Dr. Ryan Relich. And then the other one is Emerging Viruses, which does a two-part episode. And thus with Dr. Benjamin Pinsky and Dr. Ryan Relich. If you haven't checked them out, please go ahead and do so. So I want to start moving on to the posters a little bit. And I want to talk about one called uh, Penicillin Gradient Diffusion Overcalling Resistant resistance 
and promotes unnecessary vancomycin use in enterococcus faecalis bloodstream infections. And this is from Lindsay Donahue, who's a pharmacist uh, from the UVA, University of Virginia Health System. And it was very interesting talking to her and seeing how with some, you know, they were getting some discrepancies. You know, the physicians started uh, questioning the results of penicillin and they started doing some testing. And, and there was a discrepancy between uh, grading diffusion of um, testing with penicillin versus broth microdilution, and they were getting uh, re um, resistant results with the, you know, with the gradient diffusion, with the gradient strips, and they were getting more susceptibility with the same isolates on broth microdilution. So this was a very interesting poster. And then the, the, the other one was the impact of rapid identification and resistance gene detection using an algorithm-based approach in gram-negative bacteremia. And I spoke to Jason Joanda, and this is from uh, UPMC, which is the University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Medical Center. And this was actually a recurrent theme, and theme, sorry, in one of the, along the posters that I saw, and it was, it was just so, implementing, um, you know, bringing rapid testing for blood cultures. A lot of, and this is something that sometimes we might be unaware of. I mean, if you work in a large facility, you probably have an instrument uh, that does, you know, like any, some sort of uh, molecular testing on blood cultures. There are several manufacturers out there in the industry, uh, but some places don't. And, and, and having that instrument that gives you that ID and, and and that can give the, the provider an idea of what they're working with. You know, it, it affects the treatment of the patient. So this, this instruments, you know, they can detect genes. Um, you get like, like, your, like your Van A, like your MEC A, uh, MEC A for uh, MRSA, Van A for VRE, uh, for your CREs, you know, your OXA, your VIM, your KPC, your NDM. So there's different variations out there, like I said, but they do save time. So this is something that I see a trend where more places are starting to bring this type of instruments. And that's really good because it does, you know, they do help the patients out. Uh, and as you know, microbiology is all about time. And then the other one was from the University of Kentucky Healthcare. Uh, high, constant, high concordance rates between the EPLEX BCAD panels and start standard identification and susceptibility methods enable utilization of results to guide rapid antimicrobial optimization. So you know, this is a comparison using the EPLEX, which is one of those systems, uh, no relationship to the podcast, but it's a, it's a good system. You know, I work with it, I'm familiar with it. And so once again, right, you see the theme of bringing these instruments and comparing how, it, how they compare to the to the traditional identification testing, uh, which nowadays, you know, it's mostly Molotov, maybe Vitek, uh, Microscan, but it's, it's a really good, reliable instrument. So that is, in that uh, abstract, they were comparing how, how the EPLEX did, and, and it does really well. I mean, from experience, what it calls something, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's really good, very accurate. Uh, you know, you can identify staff, strep, you know, some of your enterobacterialis, uh, some of your non-fermenters. So depending on the panel, right, it varies the, the amount of organisms that it can detect. And these systems, you know, they all have their pros and cons. Some might have more components than others. Um, but overall, the end result of it is just that they provide information faster, right? Rather than just waiting, you see the gram thing, you play the, the sample, and then you have to wait 18 to 24 hours to see what actually grew. So, so that's something, you know, to, to think about if you can, maybe if you're an institution, you should definitely start looking into bringing some of these instruments. Um, so it kind of, I have been in smaller facilities and I have seen it. So I am not sure as to how it works and, and as far as why one facility doesn't have it, they might be big or small. Um, so, it's kind of, you get wrapped up in your bubble, right? And 
and I, I've been exposed to this instruments for a while. And I mean, and granted, I do work at a very large facility, uh, but I also got to spend some time at a smaller one, and there was also a system. So it's one of those things that I haven't I haven't worked in a place that where they don't have one. So once again, if you maybe you should look into this at the end, right? It just it's it saves time, and they're very reliable and accurate, and not only they provide an, IDs, but they do provide information with, from genes that confer resistance. And this one was a really good favorite of mine from Emily Kelly. And this is from the California Department of Public Health and the Department of Laboratory Medicine uh, from the University of California, San Francisco. And this was called Clinical and Epidemiology, Epidemiologic Review of Camnocytophaga infections identified at a public health reference laboratory. So this is great, and uh, this is great, and um, and I will be talking at some point more about uh, Camnocytophaga. You know, we don't see a lot, right? And we know that it's, uh, you know, it's 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 part of the some animals flora, but it's it's interesting, and we have seen some cases. You know, and we, we might see it in the lab every now and then, maybe not too often. We we heard about this case years ago where uh, the person got, I think the pet licked the, the person on the face and then they ended up losing like a, some part of it. So that, that, that was definitely horrible and terrible. Um, but overall, we don't see it much in the lab. So this was just very interesting. Uh, so uh, about, about talking about capnocytophaga and infections and and this is something that is not reportable to the health agencies, but um, according to this uh, abstract, you know, sepsis and other severe complications of capnocytophaga species are more common in immunocompromised patients, uh, particularly those with asplenia or heavy alcohol use. So they collected some data and it was fun, you know, we, it's, it's always interesting learning. It's not about learning. I mean, those of you that work in micro, you're familiar with capnocytophaga. But seeing it and and in and, and, and a poster, right, where a lot of times, you know, your enterobacterialis, your non-fermenters, they take a huge chunk of the spotlight, uh, right? So it's always interesting seeing something, something else in one of these presentations. So I really liked it. And, you know, it was, it was really fun talking to, the, to Emily about this. And, and it was a great poster. So I don't know if you're, if you're checking out this episode. Uh, Emily, you know, thank you. It's just, I think this is one of the ones that I, I, I enjoy the most as I was walking around. There was another one. Uh, do patients with candidemia need an ophthalmology examination? Uh, this is also very interesting. I wasn't, this is something that I didn't know. This is from the University of Minnesota. So that's something definitely worth uh, looking into. And then patients with candidemia and, and having eye problems. Maybe you were familiar with this or not, but it was just something very interesting to learn um, while checking out this poster. So just to kind of start wrapping it up a little bit, many great posters. So as I said, if you register, check, check these out. Uh, they're really um, worth looking into. Um, but I'm just going to mention one more and then continue moving on. So there was, this one caught my eye, and I saw this one today. And this is uh, the antagonistic activity of lactic case case bacillus, case bacillus uh, rhamnosus against carbapenem resistant acinetobacter bomania. bomania. So it was very interesting. And, and I was talking to the person that did the study and, and that was involved in it. And this, this organism, it's, it's, a pro, it's using probiotics. And they were doing like a cold culture and they saw that, you know, this, this organism, it was actually um, reducing the growth of Acinetobacter bomania. So it's something that they are looking into and it's very interesting and maybe this could be a, a, an alternative therapy. But you could see and they show me from the electron uh, micros microscope, uh, the images, and you could see, like, I guess, you know, uh, Acinetobacter was showing signs of stress 
um, you know, it was just like change, changing the shape and it just, it looked, it was definitely showing signs of stress as in the vicinity of this organism, which correlates with the fact that uh, it reduces the growth. So as you know, as an endobacter, uh, Bomania, you're getting some strains that are very resistant out there. And then we're coming out with some, um, with some antimicrobials for it. Well, as one of them, as you know, sulbactam, dorlobactam that you hear out there. So this type of studies, you know, they're very interesting. You know, they could find a way that maybe somehow, right, if you have an infection with this organism and give the patient some sort of probiotic, and if this could work, you know, this would be definitely a nice alternative to uh, antibiotics or, or at, the very, at the very least, complement it. So it was just, you know, very interesting. So the one thing that I just want to, so many great posters out there, as I have said, but one thing that I saw was, and I, and as I was walking around at some of the posters, I saw a theme. Uh, so, and, and, and it was about uh, sometimes, you know, like, like pharmacy, um, getting involved in projects with education to physicians. And, and, and they were talking about the guidelines for the IDSA guidelines for UTIs and, and immunocompromised patients. And, and overall, they were showing data that even though patients, some patients, you know, they were, um, you know, first of all, they were explaining what they consider, you know, the, the criteria for consider a urine positive, right, for, for culture. So the criteria for, to consider an UTI in a patient. And, you know, they were talking about that. And, and sometimes, you know, they say patients, even they don't show any symptoms, you know, they still get treated. And that's something that they, they try to reduce sometimes um, because it's, it's right. You, you, we, we continue prescribing antibiotics and using antibiotics and all this accessibility. And sometimes, you know, patients don't even finish them. They share them with others. And it's definitely a, a very real issue that we are seeing all this resistance out there. And, and AMR is definitely something very serious. So anything that we can do to reduce that, and I think that this is a great effort um, to see how with some education and maybe sometimes getting providers to not prescribe as, as much antibiotics as, as sometimes you know, they do. And I'm not a physician, so I'm not, I am not in their shoes. So this is from my point of view and from the pharmacy, but it is good to see people taking steps, right. To, to reduce, you know, the amount of AMR that's out there. So it's just, it takes a village to do this. You know, it takes everyone in this profession from pharmacy to doctors to a lab. So everyone has a role to play and, and we all have to play as a team to make sure that you know, we, we work on this issue. So that was a recurrent theme. So from ID week, those are the two themes that I saw a lot. Um, definitely a lot of studies com comparing antibiotics, but those two about implementation of, uh, of rapid testing for blood cultures and, how, and the effect of that. And then you know, UTI guidelines and prescribing antibiotics, a lot of good posters. And a lot of good people, and I'm definitely going to be reaching out to some to see if they are interested in doing an episode. I already have spoken to some, and they are. So stay tuned. But overall, you know, I go back to Orlando with, right, with such a high in the sense of, you know, my, my, my nerd gauge, you know, has been, it's all the way up. <laughs> so it's great. And and now it's just, you know, great doing, talking to you and, and sharing my experiences. So next year, if you have the budget, the time, definitely check out ASM. And if you're in the lab, you know, like me, like I'm an MLS, medical lab scientist, and, and I exhort you to go and check out ID Week as well if you can. They do have some great topics, and a lot of them, they're definitely right in our alley of, of of lab testing and, and you know organisms and, and antibiotics so check them out if you can um something that we maybe everyone needs to work on is maybe trying to make them a little more affordable that's 
that's the thing. I mean, not everyone can afford to, you know, hotel, um, conference, plane tickets. So it adds up a lot. So maybe if if there could be some ways where maybe like provide some sort of a, some fun for where people can apply and perhaps get grants to attend it, uh, that would be great to increase the, the attendance of them. I know that with ID Week, yeah, it's a little more in the, in the physicians, the pharmacist alley, uh, where, whereas microbe is more in the microbiologist alley. Uh, but even at, with ASM, some people might be unaware of it. And if they are, uh, they can't afford it sometimes. So that's something that, that needs to be worked up on uh, because everyone can benefit from attending these this conferences. So Dr. Gauthier, if you're listening to it, uh, thank you for those few minutes. You know, that was great. And for the audience, as always, thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. If you are listening in YouTube live, have patience. And bear with me, this is the first time trying it. So we'll continue working on that. But once I edit the episode, I will go ahead and submit the completed version to YouTube as well after I publish it on the podcast, uh, on the podcast network first. But everyone, take care. Uh, it's always, as always, I love talking to you. So continue bringing that passion to what you do. It's so important. You do such great work. So as always, stay motivated, stay safe, and of course, continue talking micro. This has been a live presentation from Boston at ID Week, the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Thank you, Boston, for the hospitality. Thank you, everyone. And until the next time. And that, my dear audience, it's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed the live the live episode from ID Week. You know, I definitely had a great time. I recommend this conference. So if you have the time and the budget, please go ahead and do so. You know, you will learn a lot. And definitely go to ASA Micro, you know. Uh, they're both great conferences. So I recommend them 100%. As always, you know, Stay tuned for great things coming your way, you know, great episodes. So I always love sharing information with you and I am very grateful for the support. So please continue bringing that passion to what you do. It's so important. You do such great work. As always, stay motivated, stay safe, and of course, continue talking micro until the next time. Bye.